thank you so much. Uh, it's a real honor to be here at Tapestry. I've been hearing a lot about Tapestry, so I'm really pleased to actually get a chance to come. Um, so I was already introduced, so this is me. So I teach uh, data visualization and civic media. That's my daughter, although actually she's a lot bigger now, <laughs> so <laughs> can't hold her like that anymore. Um, and yes. Um, so I want to take a second, so this is short, so uh, I don't want to spend too much of your time, um, but I do want to take a second and I want to talk about this term creative data literacy um, that's in the title of the talk. So in my research, I build software tools, I run workshops, um, and I do research about data literacy, um, but specifically about data literacy for people in journalism, the arts, municipal government, the nonprofit sector and community organizations. Um, so, you know, I, I think we probably all agree in this room that data literacy is something that's very important, not just for the techie folks um, and the scientific folks, um, but for everybody. I mean, as a, as a kind of general um, citizenry. Um, so, the people that I work with and that I, um, for whom I think about data literacy, um, these are not the people that are going to invent the next machine learning algorithm. They're probably not necessarily going to go on to become data scientists either. Um, but they're seeking guidance about how to meaningfully integrate data and visualization and storytelling into their work. And there should be an answer for that. Like, we should be able to say this is possible, right? Um, and to not get turned off. Um, so I've recently been using this term creative data literacy to describe some of the more creative, artistic, and civic-oriented approaches that we can take to teaching people how to work with data. So to do this, we need some way of connecting data literacy to broader forms of critical and creative inquiry and creative process, um, and also to output forms. I think we need to be open to output forms that may not look like charts and two-dimensional graphics. That might not always be the correct and appropriate output form for a particular audience. Okay, good, it's animated. Okay, so this, this humble animated GIF, um, it may not look like an example of data storytelling, but it is. Um, and so during this short story, I want to show you an example of how I've been introducing beginning concepts of working with data and data analysis to first year arts, journalism, and communication students at Emerson College. So in the case of this short story, we're going to see an example of data, and data analysis used as part of the creative process in the production of a public artwork. So the public art piece that we produced over the course of a semester was called The Future of Boston Transportation in 100 Animated GIFs. Uh, so this was a part of a course called uh, Civic Art and Design Studio that I teach for first year students at Emerson. Um, and these are non-techie students. These are students, um, I mean, they may be techie in the sense that they're really good at operating cameras, but they're not necessarily techies. They're, they don't know how to code or um, anything like this. This is not how they identify. So I always run the Civic Art and Design Studio as a partnered class, meaning that we work with an external community partner on a particular civic issue. So for this iteration of the class, our external partner was Alice Brown from the city of Boston, and in particular, the public engagement initiative that she was running called Go Boston 2030. So the Go Boston 2030 um, goal was to engage residents in a, of Boston in a large-scale visioning and planning process about what Boston transportation should look like in the year 2030. So the goal of this was to make a transportation master plan. So Boston is actually still in the process of doing this. It's the, only the second time they've ever had a transportation master plan for the city. So what was interesting about this initiative, the city of Boston got a pretty significant grant to be able to run a public engagement process that looked really different from what your typical public engagement effort looks like. So if you know anything about typical municipal engagement, it looks like meetings in dark basements <laughs> at inconvenient times of the day that you have to show up in person for. Um, and basically, the same small group of people often shows up over and over again and complains about whatever their favorite issue is. In Boston, it's typically parking. So lots of people that show up at meetings complain about parking, because uh, there's no parking. Um, <laughs> so, so um, Alice and her team really wanted a better and more diverse transportation uh, planning process. So they took a very kind of creative methodology. They drove a question truck around Boston. So you can see the question truck there uh, on the left, uh, the what's your question. 
Um, and they collected people's questions about the future of transportation in Boston. And so the idea here was sort of, sort of flip the script and say, don't give us your complaints. Um, give us your questions, give us your speculations, give us your visions um, for the future of Boston transportation. And then to also to go to the people instead of the people coming to the city. Um, so the point where we started talking was when Alice and the city had collected over 6,000 free form text questions from different citizens in 20 different neighborhoods in Boston. Um, so this amazing, wonderful and rich uh, data set of uh, questions from citizens. Um, so the city of Boston at this point could have just taken those questions and handed them over to a data analyst um, and said, okay, go into your back room, uh, do your thing, and tell us the top five things that this people say that they want. Um, but because they were running this in a kind of very open and participatory way, they looked at, um, they, they designed a way of making the data analysis process also open and also participatory, um, which is to say that they looked at data analysis as a, yet again, another opportunity for public engagement. And this is really to their credit. I think this is a really great project. And this is, this is not the part that I really had any involvement with, but um, just to say sort of what are their goals. So to that end, they hosted meetings that looked like this, that were attended by 75 to 100 people at a time, um, that where community leaders were present, and they had this open participatory process of um, people sitting at tables and work w working with each other to collaboratively filter and prioritize these 6,000 citizen questions. So Alice and I agreed when we started talking that um, creating a work of public art out of those 6,000 questions could be another method for public engagement and participatory data analysis. So to sort of serve their goals of having this open process and um, putting the work in these different locations to reach different audiences, um, as well as uh, serve as a really powerful civic learning opportunity for first year students who were new to Boston so they're coming from different places, and they were themselves just starting to use Boston's transportation system. So the thing with the data set um, might be a little bit hard to see here, but it's really lovely, it's rich, it's, it's idiosyncratic, because these are all different individual human voices. Um, there's a lot of sort of personal meaning, um, the, they're, they're funny questions at certain points. It lends itself really nicely to the cr creation of some kind of artwork. Um, so the questions are also short, um, and they reference a lot of things in the physical world. So it seems like there's no more perfect form for sort of illustrating them than the animated GIF, so which is this kind of short, sweet visual form. Um, okay, so the learning goals for the class were these. Um, so, you know, one is just to simply guide first year students in a data driven design process to, to, to think about like how can you incorporate data as part of a creative process. Um, I also wanted to teach basic data skills, so spreadsheet summarization, introductory, quantitative text analysis as part of that. Um, the third is, um, I think one of the most important things uh, when we think about teaching about data um, is that we ground it in the context of a larger inquiry process. So in this case, the topic was transportation in Boston. Um, and so this is a topic that has civic relevance um, but it also has relevance to the students' everyday lives. Like they use the transportation system pretty much every single day to get around the city in Boston. Um, so they're not just learning about data to learn about data. So I think back to, you know, when I'm, I was starting out uh, learning about things, um, and I sometimes pick on R, but, um, you know, worked with all these really super random data sets in R, like the length of guinea pig teeth, right? <laughs> so it's sort of like, why do I care? I really don't care. I, I don't care about guinea pig data, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and so really thinking about like how do we teach data in a way that has direct meaning and in which we have a stake in the outcome. I don't care which guinea pig has the longest teeth. I really don't, right? Um, so, and then the, finally, um, a learning goal in, in my case with all freshman students is to get them to leave campus. <laughs> um, yes, if you've ever taught a class at a uh, university, you know that it's very hard to get students to leave campus. So if you can get them to leave campus in their freshman year, um, that's, that's a real achievement. They might do it again. <laughs> so, um, okay, so we obviously can't make 6,000 animated GIFs. Um, or maybe we could, but that would be a different uh, project. <laughs> um, so our task was to have a design and learning process that would help us meaningfully and fairly represent the concerns of different neighborhoods, but compress the data set down to just 100 um, different questions. So this was a four-step process. 
Um, the first thing I did was um, each student got a neighborhood. So very conveniently, there was, there was the right number of neighborhoods and students. Um, so each student was assigned to a neighborhood in Boston. Um, they were responsible for going out, um, doing background research on the neighborhood, uh, collecting demographics about that neighborhood, visiting the neighborhood, and interviewing people in the neighborhood at least twice. Um, and their goal in that process was, was to get a handle on what are the transportation needs in that neighborhood. Um, what, are, what, are, what do people care about? How do they commute? Um, how do they get around? Um, so step two was where the data analysis came in. So once they had some background and context for the neighborhood's people and transportation needs, um, we moved into data analysis. Um, and here we used a platform that I've um, built uh, as a separate project with my colleague Rahul Bargov called databasic.io. Um, and so this is geared towards introducing various types of data analysis to newcomers. Um, and so we have a couple tools that do uh, quantitative text analysis. Um, and learners worked with questions submitted by residents of their neighborhood. So they took just their neighborhood questions, um, and then they compared those with questions from the whole data set, so across the city of Boston, to try to see what are the needs and themes that make their neighborhood in particular unique. Um, and so each learner produced a data analysis report, that's that long image on the right, um, that summarized their findings and related them to the background research and the interviews that they had done. Um, so the third step, after they had done their data analysis, was we were finally at the point, and this, is, this took quite some time, um, but we were finally at the point where they can select representative questions for their neighborhood. So each student was charged with selecting five questions that would represent the transportation concerns of their neighborhood, um, with then the goal that they would then be illustrating those as an animated GIF. Um, so here, um, the student's question was, how can we make it safe to walk 24-7 in every neighborhood, and she goes into her rationale. So they, they had to really justify these decisions. They're not just kind of like randomly selecting which things make sense, but saying, well, this is an issue that affects this particular neighborhood because the majority of people that are in the downtown neighborhood actually use walking as a mode of transportation, um, and so on and so forth. So there's a kind of whole rationale for why, why does this question make sense to represent this particular neighborhood. Um, and so here's where the students really shine. Um, and again, remember, these are first year students. Um, again, they're just getting, <laughs> so this is, the, this is the how can we make it safe to walk 24 seven in every neighborhood. <laughs> um, so they're just getting started also with media production in a lot of cases. So again, the GIF is a perfect form <laughs> to try to illustrate these questions. Um, so students use found footage. Uh, they created their own footage. Um, and they even sometimes created their own animations. And so I'll show you a couple of, um, of these 100 um, questions. <laughs> uh, and so some of these gifts were quite original and artistic. question here is, will the buses get bigger? And then some provided veiled or not so veiled social commentary. <laughs> so, so despite the city of Boston wanting people not to complain, there were a lot of questions that were complaints, it sort of veiled as questions. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> This was a particular one that um, the, the students of Boston uh, are very vocally in support of, uh, is extending the T system so that it's 24 hours a day. Um, and then some of the gifts were more aspirational and speculative. Yeah. 
<laughs> that was the best one. I've never heard of a running highway. I kind of like that idea. <laughs> no. um, and then, of course, a number of the gifts were fun and funny. The question there is, will there ever be a way to get to East Boston by foot or by bike? <laughs> Why isn't there a subway stop further into Southie? <laughs> this is how people in South Boston feel all the time. <laughs> Um, and so a couple even managed to be somewhat profound. So this one is, what will not change? All right, so at the end of the class, we went public. We had an installation that was displayed on a large projection screen in an Emerson building just off of a public alleyway. Um, so this was up for uh, six months. Um, the whole, and we had the gifts on a loop, uh, so the, the whole loop took about like 45 minutes to play. Uh, we had a great crowd for the opening. A lot of people um, came out to see it, including Alice and her team, senior transportation officials from the city, students, members of the public. Um, and then later, the students' work was featured on the Go Boston 2030 website um, and also on the websites of some of the Go Boston partners as well. Um, so just to conclude, uh, we often talk about data as evidence, um, but these animated GIFs don't, they don't look a lot like evidence, right? Um, but the student's work is grounded in a rigorous design process that combined this on the ground visits and interviews with data analysis. And so what the GIFs are good at is showing a very intentionally selected citizen questions about the future of transportation in Boston, in a sense being a representative sample and by some sort of measure of the neighborhoods, um, drawing our attention to individual variation, citizen voices, and collective visions for the future of transportation in Boston. Um, and so while I very much hope that data still will be used as evidence, because I don't like the alternative facts world <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, I think there's also something to be said for using data to create evidence-driven inspiration. There's a slightly different mode of communication. Um, so thank you so much. You can see the, all of the gifts are posted on this website and on the Tumblr site, um, and then my contact info is there, and I'd love to talk with all of you more about this.